Chat, uh, sponsored by both the Rudy Center for the Study of American Democracy, which I direct, and the colloquium on the interdisciplinary study of religion. And looking around the room, it looks like we have a fair representation from the regular Rudy Center crowd, and what I assume the regular CISR crowd. So we're glad to be able to uh, have such a large turnout to hear John show today. Uh, my name is uh, David Campbell, and uh, I'll take just a few moments here to introduce John. But just before I do that, let me see, and I apologize for those who are not Rudy Center regulars, but we do take these opportunities to make a couple of announcements if necessary. Um, and I don't actually have any announcements, but I know I'm but No, I, we're, we're good. Uh, the grand cut was, that's, that's the only announcement. Well, if there isn't any other business, let me move to introducing our speaker, John Shields. John comes to us today from uh, Claremont McKenna College, and unfortunately he had quite the uh, ordeal traveling here yesterday, but nonetheless stuck with it. Here he is. <laughs> um, John has a PhD from the University of Virginia. He's taught at a few other places, but uh, I just learned that he has been recently at Claremont McKenna. John is a prolific uh, author. He's written a number of very interesting uh, pieces, but he's perhaps best known uh, for his book, The Democratic Virtues of the Christian Right, uh, published by Princeton University Press a few years ago, and uh, has generated a lot of attention, frankly. Um, a lot of people are paying attention to that book because he has to say in it. And, uh, I know he has a forthcoming book that is titled, or will be titled, The Elephant in the Classroom, Conservative Professors and the Politics of Higher Education, that will be forthcoming from Oxford. But today, we'll be hearing about the culture wars, or I guess we should say the future of the culture wars. Please join me in welcoming John Shields. As Dave mentioned, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, uh, the future of the culture wars, and uh, this is an interesting time, I think, to reflect on this subject, because some have wondered whether or not the culture wars have a future. Um, and the most prominent example um, is actually President Obama. Uh, when he was running for president in 2008, um, he, he uh, went to speak at, at a Planned Parenthood, and uh, there he and I really like the way he put this. He said the culture wars are just so nice. Uh, so the culture wars are sort of like the Macarena or something. There's uh, uh, that overtook the nation for a brief while, but now they're, they're going out of fashion and are going to disappear. And I actually think his prophecy uh, or his implicit prediction about the future um, can't be dismissed as the wishful thinking of a democratic president who would like to see some of these divisive moral issues go away. I think there's a large and growing body of evidence that suggests that he might, in fact, be right. Um, as measured by social uh, uh, public opinion polls, uh, social conservatism is, is on the decline. Um, every year, uh, surveys reveal growing levels of, of, of social liberalism. Um, and, and we are a much more liberal nation on social questions than we were a few, day, uh, a few decades ago. Um, in fact, one recent study uh, found that uh, young evangelicals are less opposed to cohabitation, pornography, uh, sex before marriage, and are more supportive of same-sex marriage than, than are their elders. Um, and if these broad national trends continue, it seems to me that same-sex marriage is likely to be in our future with or without uh, the intervention of the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, if you look at activists, um, broad multi-issue uh, Christian right organizations are on the decline as well. The moral majority is long gone. And even the organizations that still exist, like the Christian Coalition and Concerned Women for America, are really shells of their former selves. Right? I mean, they basically have become uh, Washington organizations uh, without, without an active grassroots base. Um, 
Meanwhile, many of the most polarizing uh, figures in the Christian right uh, have either uh, passed away uh, or have largely disappeared from the public scene, including Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, James Dobson, and Randall Terry. Today's grassroots activists in the Tea Party, meanwhile, are largely focused on, on economic issues, despite the fact that many of them are, in fact, religious. Emily Eakin, who is a PhD student uh, in politics at UCLA, um, recently attended a large Tea Party rally in which she took um, she took lots of photographs, just, just handmade signs, she took about 250 pictures, and then she did a content analysis of these signs. And she found that about 5% reflected, uh, could be described as, as, as containing culturally conservative messages or sort of traditional cultural war kinds of concerns. Um, so the political landscape, I think, looks a lot different than it did in, in the 1980s or 90s. And Obama is certainly right about that. Right? There's reasons to think that a lot of these uh, uh, moral issues would be less divisive, uh, would be less divisive in the future. Um, and it's not primarily because Americans are becoming less religious, right? I and mean, that's, that's not the big explanation. Um, rising social liberalism has been uh, uh, a very powerful trend among, uh, among religious believers. Um, religious believers have simply become much more liberal on a range of social questions than they were just a few decades ago. Um, now, an important exception to this broad trend um, is, um, is abortion attitudes. Uh, abortion opinion has basically remained unchanged since Roe was decided nearly four decades ago. In fact, it's one of the most stable public attitudes. Nor are pro-life organizations particularly on the decline, right? So the National Right to Life Committee has a lot of active state affiliates. There are some 2,000 crisis pregnancy centers, which in fact outnumber uh, the number of abortion clinics. Um, and pro-life pro marches continue to attract hundreds and thousands of, 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 of activists every, every, every year. Um, meanwhile, young Americans are, are suddenly somewhat less pro-choice than, uh, than older Americans, even though they are the most socially liberal age cohort uh, they're the most like, and they're the most likely to support um, gay rights. Uh, in, the recent, uh, in a recent edition of Understanding Public Opinion, uh, Clyde Wilcox uh, found that the millennial generation is, quote, less pro-choice than any uh, other age group. And it's also markedly less pro-choice than any um, uh, young age co cohort in any previous decade. Okay, so they're, they're, they're less pro-choice than the elders, and they're less pro-choice than younger people were um, uh, not long ago. Um, and they're becoming this way even though they're more socially conservative, on, or they're more socially liberal um, on, on a big number of questions. Okay, so what's what's going on, right? How do we make sense of these trends? Um, why are today's uh, secular young people moving at least somewhat to the right on abortion, while today's religious youth are moving uh, are, are moving to the left on issues like same-sex marriage? And from a, a somewhat larger perspective. Why hasn't uh, why hasn't the spread of social liberalism left our country any more pro than it was in 1973 when, when Roe was decided? Why would abortion opinion remain so divided and conservative in an era of dramatic social liberalization? So um, these are some of the broad trends I'm going to try to uh, uh, shed some light on today. Well. I think to begin with, any sensible explanation to these kinds of trends must dispense with the received wisdom about the culture wars. So um, I'm going to spend a few minutes just kind of outlining this traditional wisdom. And then I'm going to articulate why I think it's wrong, right? why, why, why we need to abandon this view. And then I'll try to attempt to make, a, 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 I'll try to offer a, a better theory for making sense, sense of these developments. Well, as the term suggests, right, the culture war thesis um, posits that the, the modern era has, has given birth to distinct cultures, right? And they're, and they're, they're increasingly clashing in the, public, in the public sphere. And when proponents of this thesis use the word culture, 
by culture they mean a certain kind of um, a normative order, right? It's, it's a sort of system of values and beliefs um, which are necessary to, to, compromise, to, to comprehend ourselves and our place in it. Um, indeed, proponents of this thesis tend to argue that we're, we, you know, we, we're divided by very distinct worldviews. And for those who believe a kind of, kind of theory, um, our moral conflicts have been so fierce at times because we're not just fighting about any particular issue, right? We're not, we're not just fighting about abortion or gay marriage or sex education. Um, we're fighting about something much larger, something much bigger than that. In fact, we're fighting over uh, a, 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 sort of, a sort of entire way of comprehending our world, right? We're fighting over some larger civilization or culture or normative order or whatever you want to call it. And to make this more concrete, um, I'll, focus, I'll focus my comments on how proponents of this thesis have understood the subject of, of, of the, the, understood the conflict over abortion. I place my focus here um, partly because it's been the most salient and enduring issue in the larger culture war, uh, and because part of my larger mission today is to try to make sense of why this issue has, uh, has endured as a conflict um, more so than, than, than the others. Well, a really classic work in this tradition is Kristen Luker's um, Abortion in the Politics of Motherhood, which was published in 1984. And no other work on abortion has approached its influence. Right? It's been cited well over 1,000 times, uh, which is far more than any other essay or, or um, book on abortion. Um, a distant second is Judith Jarvis Thompson's um, uh, classic essay that defended abortion rights uh, called A Defense of Abortion. It's been cited about uh, half as many times as Luther's book. Right? So Luther is really sort of in a camp by herself. Um, and oddly enough, her account is rarely ever challenged. Um, now, I will, I will challenge her view today. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do so I think, in a way that, that, that tries to be fair to her view. Um, Luther argued that pro-life and pro-choice activists um, don't really fight about abortion because, because they either believe the embryo's fate is the fate is at stake, or because they fear women will die in back alleys. Um, instead, they, she argued that they fight about abortion because of what the issue of abortion represents or symbolizes. And she says, when we dig below the surface, um, we find that two, con two competing conceptions of motherhood are, are at war. Right? And that's what's really driving all the passion. Right? That's what's really going on. As she put it, and I'll, I'll quote her now, uh, she, she wrote famously, uh, well, on the surface, it is the embryo's fate that seems to be at, at stake. The abortion debate is actually about the meaning of women's lives. So for pro-choice activists, um, Luther argued that, that abortion rights are, are a sort of symbolic recognition um, uh, of, of uh, a women's equality with men and freedom from the burdens of, of motherhood. And pro-life activists, on the, uh, on the other hand, um, regard abortion as a sort of symbolic affront to the, to the sacred and high calling of motherhood. So in this view, if abortion becomes acceptable, commonplace, <laughs> the motherhood itself just becomes one lifestyle choice, and maybe not even a particularly desirable one. Um, so, pro lifers she argued, fight abortion, because abortion itself fosters a kind of worldview that devalues motherhood, right? that downgrades the, tradi the traditional roles of, of men and women. So, Luther argued that, that abortion itself is really about these broader gender ideologies, right? That's really what's at stake. And if you think otherwise, Luther thinks you're just sort of missing the forest for the trees, right? You're not, you don't really see what's going on here. You're not seeing the bigger picture. Now, her account had some, it had some real empirical support on its side, right? Activists in the abortion conflict 
lifted particularly back in the early 80s, did tend to have their views about motherhood. Right? That was true. Um, the pro-lifers in her study did tend to think that motherhood had been de denigrated culturally. And the lives of these women tended to, tended to reflect these, these values. Right? So that the pro-life women in, in Luther's study tended to be stay-at-home moms while the pro-choice women tended to be more, much more career-oriented. Nonetheless, I think, I think the thesis is wrong. It distorted the way we think about the abortion politics in particular, but also our moral conflicts in more, more general. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think this, this is wrong, right? why the thesis is wrong. I think maybe the biggest problem is that it's based theoretical predictions turned out to be false. Right? So if, if pro-life sentiment was driven by gender traditionalism, right, if that was true, then we would expect that the demise of gender traditionalism in recent decades would lead to a growth in pro-choice sentiment right, in the broader public. That would seem like that would follow. <coughs> but this hasn't happened. Like not even a little bit. Not even a tiny bit. Pro-life citizens, in fact, have greatly liberalized on gender issues over the last few decades without becoming any less opposed to abortion. Right? There doesn't seem to be any evidence that's true. So today, for example, um, if you consult the um, National Election Survey, you'll find that there are relatively few pro-choice or pro-life citizens who will say that women's role is in the home. Right? In fact, according to the 2008 NES, um, about 7% of pro-life citizens will take this view. About a quarter of pro-life citizens are sort of more ambivalent. Right? They're not quite sure. Um, they're, they're torn between the sense that maybe, maybe women's place is in the home, maybe it's out in, in the world. Um, and this leaves a large majority of pro-life citizens who say, in fact, about 70% of them, um, who say that a woman's role is not in the home caring, caring for her children. It's out in the public sphere alongside men. And this dramatic change from where pro-life opinions stood in 1980, um, when only about a third of pro-lifers really asserted this strong view in, in gender equality. <coughs> in fact, if you look over the, last, over the last few decades or so, gender liberalization has been far more among pro-life citizens than it has among pro-choice pro citizens. And this is largely, of course, because in, in 1980, pro-choice citizens were already sort of in a feminist vanguard, right? They were already pretty liberal on that issue, and so there wasn't a lot of space for them to become more liberal. And because for life, there was a lot of room for them to become more liberal over time. But it's also the case right, that pro-life citizens have been much more influenced by feminist ideals, right, than the culture war thesis would, would suggest. Or that most, and, and more so than most observers have appreciated. So this means that the, the kind of divide over gender that used to be much starker between pro-lifers and pro-choicers is not really closing. Right? Now there is much divide, at least if you consult public opinion survey. And if the views of younger pro-life uh, citizens are an indication of the future, it seems to me that the abortion wars will be increasingly fought, fought out by gender egalitarians. Right? It cease to be any meaningful difference between these folks on that issue. <laughs> now, you see these trends regardless of the survey you consult, right? So you consult other questions on the NES, you can consult the, the general social survey, um, and you'll see this any place you like. Now, I suppose it's certainly possible, right? It's certainly possible that pro-life activists Right, could have resisted these broad measures. Right, maybe they're disproportionately drawn from this increasingly small uh, group of gender traditionalists in the pro life movement. Right, and maybe this has always been true. Yet here again, the, the evidence for the politics of motherhood is, is surprisingly weak. Right, even if we look at the movement back in the 60s and 70s. So far from California, where Luther did her field research, you look in places like St. Louis, in Washington, D.C., in, in, at, at Ar Ann Arbor, Michigan, the most radical wing of the right to life movement was pioneered by Catholics who were on the left, right, who thought of themselves as liberals. Right? And in the wake of the Roe decision, it was these liberal Catholics 
um, these liberal Catholics es essentially decided that normal politics was fine, right? They thought it was, it didn't make sense to spend time trying to lobby your state legislature because where is that going to get you in this, in this post-Roe world? Um, so a lot of, so they decided that it would make more sense to practice civil disobedience, right, out, out in front of abortion clinics. And many of these Catholics had cut their political teeth uh, on the Vietnam War, right? A lot of them protested either the war, the nuclear proliferation. And when the abortion controversy emerged, um, they imagined that their activism was part of this consistent Catholic of life, right? They were just, this is sort of this <coughs> new front on, on this, uh, 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 on this, that, that motive this, this larger habit. And I think this fact alone actually has important implications for those reasons, right? So what held these, their, these, these Catholics' various political enthusiasms together could not have been the politics of motherhood, right? Because why would politics of motherhood compel them to protest the war, right? Or, or a nuclear proliferation, right? Um, why would a traditional view of motherhood compel them to do that? I think it makes more sense just to say, hey, look, their activism um, was driven by the faith in the sanctity of life that we, as that was construed and understood by the Catholic Church. And um, that makes more sense of their worldview, right? If you want to make something of worldview. Um, these Catholics were also not particularly conservative on gender issues, right? At least as far as um, the evidence suggests. So, for example, if the movement's leader, John O'Keefe, uh, took his wife's name in 1976, changing it to Kavanaugh O'Keefe. As, that's just a sort of a gesture of his feminist politics. Yeah. And these early pro-life radicals were so ensconced in this world of, of, of sort of leftist politics that they initially attempted to recruit their liberal friends, right? They thought, well, other good liberals should support us in this movement. Um, that didn't go well. Uh, they were roundly rejected. Um, some Catholics, such as Daniel Berrigan, who is you know, this priest who is famous for playing <coughs> draft cards, um, was so stung by this development that he dropped pro-life activism altogether. Right? He just didn't, didn't mention abortion after, after, after that sort of fallout with the left. Um, but other Catholics on the left continued to fight abortion um, and seek new allies. Right? They sort of struck out with the left. Um, and they eventually discovered that, they, that, they, that conservative Protestants in this issue and could be mobilized around this issue. And conservative Protestants were really sort of beginning to get active in this movement in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, evangelical Protestants had really stayed away from this movement right, for, um, uh, for quite, quite a while, uh, despite the fact that they were gender traditionalists, right? despite, that, despite the fact that that was generally true. Um, it required a, uh, a massive campaign to mobilize them. And the most important figure in that campaign was Francis Schaeffer. And um, you know, Schaeffer traveled around the country and he showed his uh, documentary that was titled Whatever Happened to the Human Race? And he showed it to large groups of evangelical audiences. But there's no evidence that actually sh that, that Schaeffer appealed to their gender traditionalism. Right? And this fact is actually unsurprising given that Schaeffer had no interest in the issue. Right? So for example, he, um, he was happy to have the support of Phyllis Schaffley, right, who was uh, the main opponent of the ERA. Uh, and he was happy to have her support because she supported abortion. But he had no interest in fighting ERA or feminism. He just didn't have an interest in those things. Um, now, when Operation Rescue was founded by Randall Terry in 1986, um, <coughs> Protestants, and, and in particular Protestant fundamentalists, are really performing this radical wing of, the, of this pro-life movement, right? They're becoming more uh, numerous, uh, they're, they're uh, and, 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 and more important in, in what came to be called the rest of the movement. And they start to, to reform sort of the early sort of 60s feel of, of this movement. Uh, and among other changes to, to, to the movement itself is that women were excluded from leadership positions in, inside of Operation Rescue. Uh, Julie Loesch, who is one of the few remaining liberal, sort of lefty Catholics in the early days of the movement, sort of stuck around with Terry and, 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 and his guys. And um, she complained about this, right? I mean, so she, as she put it, um, Terry and his, as she called them, were quite, deliberate, quite deliberately subordinating women. So, okay, here's a very prominent and important case uh, in which staunch 
really staunch gender traditionalists are really leading the movement, and indeed are shaping the larger organization, right? shaping the way it works. And I suppose this development is in some ways consistent with Luther's thesis, except that it's men, not women, who are leading the charge. But there is no evidence right, that, these, that these fundamentalists were driven by the politics of motherhood. Right? Uh, many had to join the movement, either because they, they saw Schaefer's documentary, which was important. So for example, Terry wept, reportedly wept openly after he first saw Schaefer's documentary. And then after that, just devoted his life to fighting abortion. Um, so Terry was, uh, and is, I suppose, probably still a very traditional guy with some issues of gender. Um, but there's just no evidence that they compelled him to join the movement, right? That that's what caused him to get involved. Um, and this is true of lots of others, right? Particularly those who got involved only after they saw images of aborted fetuses, right? Which is one of the, perhaps the most important mobilization tool uh, in the pro-life movement. But if Luger's right, right, if it's, if it's, if the embryo's fate isn't really what's at stake, right, if it's really about these other things, if it's really about the meaning of women's lives, it's not clear why so many pro-lifers would embrace this activism only after seeing, after, uh, only after viewing images of aborted embryos, right? Why, why would it be so important? Luger's thesis, I think, also has a, it also has a, uh, well, Luker argued that her, her explanation helps us understand why the abortion debate is so hard fought, right? Why it's so passionate. <clears throat> and actually, I think it's sort of the opposite is true, actually. I think if you accept this, it's actually hard to comprehend why the issue has been so different from all the others, right? It's hard to make sense of why it's been so passionate and hard fought. Right? Um, so I think if you push the embryo to the margins of the controversy, Suddenly, actually, just doesn't make sense, right? It's more, or particularly on the pro-life side. Um, but I think this is particularly true if you try to make sense of the passion uh, of those who practice civil disobedience, <clears throat> because these are, after all, the persons who were willing to break the law and then suffer the consequences, right? And some of the consequences were not so great, right? I mean, a lot of these folks got beaten up pretty badly by the cops, um, sometimes really badly. Uh, one. Uh, uh, one man's shoulders were dislocated, right? Uh, activists complained of being denied care, medical care while prison. Uh, young female protesters <coughs> wondered that they were forced to crawl around naked while all in Atlanta prisons. And of course, you just had a ton of these things, right? There was, there was more than 600 blockades, right? More than uh, 30,000 arrests, right? This makes it one of the largest campaigns of social disobedience in American history. It's just not clear to me that politics and motherhood I right, can explain this, right, that it can give, make sense of it, right? Our, it because in, in a sense, it asks us to believe that these activists, um, right, uh, were willing to get beaten up, spend time in jail, waste all their vacation time, do all these things for, for the politics of motherhood. Right? That's <coughs> not what did it. Uh, and did the violent fringe, right? Did they decide they, did they decide that they wanted to bomb clinics or even murder providers? Uh, because of some cultural anxiety, right? Because motherhood had somehow not been properly honored. I just, I, I simply think that it's, it's not especially a plausible account of this kind of devotion and sacrifice. I think a much more plausible account uh, for why pro-life activists, or at least some pro-life activists, have been this passionate, is actually really believe that abortion kills human beings, right? It seems to me that's, that's. That's a more straightforward explanation. Um, now, one may argue, as, as certainly many academics would, that they're misguided for believing such a thing. But I don't think you can easily comprehend these folks if you don't accept that, that point of view. Right? That's their frame of reference. Um, and as I mentioned today, right, I mean, having hung out and talked to a lot of pro-lifers in the context of my participation work, right, um, I never heard them talk about it. I mean, all they talk about is dead babies, right? Sort of constantly. That's the language they use, right? Um, they got to stop the baby killers. That's 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 their obsession, right? Um, so, okay. Um, now, having said all that, <coughs> it's certainly true. Um, it's certainly true that gender traditionalism has been present in the movement, and at times it's even been common, right? I don't want to overstate sort of the early liberalism of some of the Catholics. 
but that doesn't mean that it mattered very much. Right? Maybe it was just there, right? I mean, as, as the historian David Chappelle put it in the context of another social movement, this belief is not, that is, this belief in gender traditionalism is not the belief that made the movement move. Right? Yes, it existed. Um, but we can say this a lot about a lot of movements, right? I mean, uh, look at other um, right Christian social movements, right? We're talking about you know the abolitionists, or the civil rights activists, or the solidarity movement in Poland. I mean, these, these movements are so full of people who are fairly traditional on the questions of gender and family. Um, that's not the ideal that motivated them. Right? It's not the ideal that gave them their their idealism. And their um, and their inspiration. Okay, so let's say for a moment, bracket this. Let's say for a moment that um, this dominant account of abortion politics is wrong. What's what's a better account, right, of our moral uh, differences? Um, why has abortion opinion remained so divided, right, and conservative in this era of dramatic social liberalization, right? Why isn't our nation any more pro-choice than it was in 1973? Well, I, th I think there is a strong case to be made for what Louis Hartz called America's liberal tradition, actually. And it's, I think it's this tradition which helps us understand um, why Americans, and especially religious Americans, embrace the gender revolution without abandoning their pro-life commitments. And I also think it helps us understand why young secular Americans sh show some, some real sympathy for pro-life claims. Indeed, even Hollywood producers, right, are now making films with, with somewhat pro-life themes, right, from Juno to Knocked Up. It's hard to imagine that these same writers um, would ever create a major motion picture that was not, that was say, critical of same-sex marriage. So I think the abortion controversy remains deadlocked. Precisely because both the pro-life and the pro-choice positions resonate in a common, I want to emphasize that sort of common liberal culture, right? not one that's divided between uh, you know, traditionalists and, 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 and secular liberals. And this, the resonance of the abortion issue makes it different from other kinds of, con other kinds of issues. Right? So um, if you look at other so-called culture war issues, the conservative <coughs> position consistently, consistently just loses ground <coughs> year after year. Just, they, these are not winning issues in the larger culture. And I think that's true because, um, uh, because they tend to offend Americans um, the respect for individualism and, and equality. Right? They, they offend Americans in the sense that, that uh, their, their own conception of, of freedom. Now, this doesn't mean that there's not meaningful differences between pro-life and pro-choice citizens. Right? I, mean, I actually think there are some differences. Uh, pro-life citizens, in particular, are certainly much more religious right, than, than pro-choice Americans. But this difference doesn't separate them in radically different cultures, right, in radically different camps. Instead, I think it just helps us understand why each side has a different sense of the embryo state status and the, the competing stakes right, in this controversy. Nor does common liberal tradition um, necessarily mean that our future will be more harmonious in any way. I don't want to suggest that. I mean, um, I see that probably because liberalism is just sort of a, a, a sort of schismatic tradition, right? It's not clear how you interpret the de declaration or apply the promises of the declaration to particular kinds of controversy. So, um, in addition, um, I think the, the abortion controversy is likely to endure for a long time. And I think it'll endure precisely because both sides think of themselves as the heirs to the civil rights movement. If, if both sides really think they are expanding the frontiers of human freedom. And it may be the other the only conflict in American history in which that's been true, right? We really have two social movements buddy heads that really have this common self-understanding. So I think as long as we remain children of the Declaration of Independence, uh, this is a conflict that will continue to divide America even as other culture war issues slowly fade from our collective memory right, and cease to become uh, important controversies. Okay, so right there.
Should we clap? <laughs> John, what we've uh, traditionally done is just allow the speaker to kind of moderate your own sure. queue of questioners. Uh, if things get out of hand, I'll step in. But, uh, it seems like a pretty civil crowd. I see a hand in the way back. I'll start with where you ended. You, you, okay. you, you mentioned that there's th this the issue with abortion is likely to continue while others fade. Do you see any other issue that might have either similar characteristics or similar long-lasting effects besides abortion? What's the, what's the closest, basically, that has the same kind of characteristics? It's the runner-up? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, well, I think in some ways the, the gay marriage controversy is somewhat hard to predict because it's, it's relatively new, you know, and, and we're just, um, but, <clears throat> I mean, I can imagine, I can imagine, um, well, I, I know that, you know, there's some anxiety that, that um, if the Supreme Court decides that there's a constitutional right to gay marriage, that it'll become, in effect, the next row, in the sense that uh, it won't end a controversy, it'll just, it'll just give one party a sense that something very legitimate has been done, uh, that this, this issue hasn't been able to play itself out in the public square. I actually think that's unlikely to happen, right? Just given recent trends. I mean, I think that um, you know Americans will continue to liberalize on that issue, or if they don't liberalize, I think you know it could be that conservatives will sort of privatize this, right? That is, even if there's some residual traditional view <coughs> on marriage, it seems likely that a lot of conservatives might just privatize, right, their own, their own point of view and not make it a public a public kind of kind of cause. Um, we've seen this with divorce, for example, right? I mean, there's basically no resistance to the divorce revolution. Okay? It's just a silent revolution. Um, and I think it's, you know, the reasons for that are, I think, are probably complicated. Uh, but one of them may have been that just, you know, this, this you know, conservatives were just sort of uncomfortable um, pressing their own views of marriage, right, In, and, and making them a sort of universal standard. So I can imagine lots of conservatives increasingly saying, look, you know, my church doesn't endorse same-sex marriage, but um, I'm, I'm happy if others do it. That's, that's, hard, that's hard to do in the case of abortion, right? It's, it's hard to privatize that view and say, uh, it's in some sense that there's something just really unserious about it, right? Well, I think it's murder, but it's okay um, if others do it. I think that works a lot better with some of these other issues. Um, so I say that I say this with a big caveat that you know I shouldn't be predicting the future. I'm a social scientist. I really struggle making sense of the past. In fact, that's mostly what I've tried to do today. Um, but uh, I'd be surprised if if um, if gay marriage continues to be a big controversy 50 years from now. Um, abortion? I don't know. I think that's that, that's that, that's still around. Um, so I don't know. That's very satisfying, but I'm. Okay, to limit some my Yes. John, let me uh, let me propose a different scenario based on exactly the same okay. trends that you like. So you're suggesting that uh, because the line on abortion, support or opposition for abortion, has largely stayed steady mm -hmm. since Roe v. Wade, going forward we should expect abortion to continue to be this highly contentious issue. But you also um, cited uh, Clyde Wilcox and. Clyde is referring to yeah. the work of, of others as well, showing that um, young people today are on the one hand the most secular group in the population by a long shot, and they are also more right. likely to be pro-life than their parents, maybe right. not so much their grandparents, but certainly their parents. So we have this group that's trending pro-life. Now we don't overstate that. It's yeah, we don't trending right. ambivalence toward abortion, maybe. The right. Juno generation right. captures that next week. Right. But they're not, it's not that that's driven by the kind of traditionalism that you're also mentioning, because it's, you know, as you said, they're socially liberal, and they're not religious, right? It's not, that's right. can't be coming from the church, it's not a very terribly religious group. Right. So if, if the young, that young, if that flat line is actually disguising the fact that we've got a highly pro-choice group that's going to fade out of the population, while the pro-life group becomes a larger share of the population, that would suggest that the line will move in a more pro-life direction, and if that's the case, why would we expect abortion to continue to be divisive? Doesn't that suggest that it will cease to be much of an issue? That's not to say it will go away, but that it might not be what it is today. 
Maybe. I mean, it depends on what you make of the, those trends on the secular side. I mean, I sort of see them as, um, I mean, it's, I mean, Clyde Wilcox, who, who studies this millennial generation, uh, I mean, he, he doesn't want to call them pro-life, right? So he, 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 he carefully says they're less pro-choice, yeah, right? So they're, they're comfortable with some more restrictions on abortion than some of their elders. Um, I'd be, I guess I'd be so much surprised if they really, those trends continue such that they really embrace pro-life view in a, in a sort of, in a sort of, um, in a fuller way. Um, uh, maybe partly because religion is the important part of that, right? I mean, it's, it's um, I mean, it, it is true if you look at the pro-life activists, right? They are overwhelmingly Christians, and that, that religiosity does seem important to, to but developing or forming uh, a sort of thoroughgoing pro-life view. Whether that could happen among secular Americans, I think that you're suggesting in a sort of fuller way, I'd be somewhat somewhat surprised. Right? I mean, it certainly happens occasionally. I've seen certain intellectuals who have, have that view. Um, but I'd sort of be surprised if that happened in a mass, in a mass way. Um, so. so I'm not sure. Uh, Christine. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Jeff. Uh, well, Dave sort of stole my question, but let me um, let me let me ask sort of a little ask it in a little different way, and also ask a, one other question. So why not? Because I, th I think your assessment of Clyde's work is exactly right. That these people are not pro-life in the sense of the pro-life activists wanting to ban abortion. <coughs> their their acceptance of restrictions, limitations on abortion. Clyde attributes to the fact that abortion rights are protected. Um, and so the, the, the debate, the controversy is no longer about should we ban it, should we not. It's about should we restrict it within the confines of basically the law of the land being abortion rights. Um, so I, I guess then my question is why not why not a, an eventual movement along the lines that Dave is suggesting not to a pro-life consensus, but more in the form of, of, say, Hunter and before the shooting begins, as sort of a middle ground consensus that abortion rights remain protected, but that there are some serious limitations and, and restrictions within that. Um, so, so the second question, just uh, I'll make brief, um, and it relates to this, which is you, you never really mention the role of political parties. Uh, of course, the Republican Party is partly responsible for bringing together <coughs> pro-life sentiments with gender traditionalism through its coalition and through its, its support from and of the Christian right. Um, and, and so, you know, and the Republican Party has also helped to reshape the abortion issue around um, restrictions as opposed to, to bans yes. and, and uh, getting rid of partial birth abortion. So, um, so I guess the question there is, you know, the, the Republican Party has continued to be on the gender traditionalist side and on the anti-gay marriage side, and and it's even brought back a little bit with, with Santorum, the, the pairing of kind of the politics of motherhood with the, the anti-abortion politics. Um, but yet the party, and, and we might say, well, the, the, the party is being divided so, so clearly on abortion is what has sort of kept it alive, but it hasn't prevented social liberalism from increasing on other issues. So I guess, the, could you just say a word about how the parties fit in the <coughs> going battle? Well, your, your first point is about ambivalence, right? Could, it, could ambivalence become more ascendant? And I suppose it's possible, but right, we've got, we've had a lot of ambivalence on abortion for a long time, right? That's, that's the main uh, your average American is ambivalent about it, um, and nonetheless, we keep seeing activists, right, sort of at, at the at, at the ends, and and I don't see any reason to believe that will change. Right? I mean, that's just been a seems like a permanent feature of American politics for such a long time. <coughs> that um, you know, the fact that young people are becoming maybe more ambivalent than we'd otherwise imagine. I, I don't know what that the implications would that be for for actually reducing just sort of the level. Of Activists on, on either end. Um, so I'm not. I'm not sure that's. Um, and and maybe you know as, as long as 
I mean, you know, of course, the, I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in the sort of post rogue context, right, I mean, there's, there's a way in which it's, you know, we're, we're always in some ways sort of fighting over row, right? And that, that tends to be, that, that tends to naturally sort of pol polarizes at least some of the activists. Um, I, I, on the party side, I guess I don't know what, in what sense, gender traditionalism is in the GOP or what one might mean by that. I mean, there's not a, um, it doesn't seem to me that they're articulating that as a, as a idea, right? I mean, even, um, it seems to me even someone like a Sarah Palin, right? There's something about, right? There's a, this is sort of a post-feminist Christian conservative, right? Someone who's, um, and I just don't see, I don't see it particularly in the rhetoric, although, you know, I mean, I know you study the Republican Party itself more than I do, but I don't know if I, I don't see it there is anymore. See it in the rhetoric or policy, right? What it would look like, right? I mean, really since, ERA, right, which was, uh, um, uh, you know, obviously that, that was kind of gender traditionalism for sure, that those who opposed it. If, if that issue ever came back, it's sort of interesting, right? If that issue could, could somehow revive, um, what would these conservatives do, right? Would they, um, and my guess is they would oppose it, probably, probably, but I'm not sure they'd oppose it because they were gender traditionalists, right? I mean, maybe they'd oppose it because. They think this could end up meaning uh, taxpayers are paying for abortions or something like that. But but it's not clear that they that issue would get the traction it could in the '70s when there was just much more gender traditionalism in the culture. Yeah. Christina, I think it's got wants wants to pivot me on this one. Well, first of all, I very much look forward to your paper. I still teach Luker. I would love to teach yeah. Luker with what you wrote so that the students right. could. I think that's fantastic. Uh, we can have a discussion and we can at lunch yeah. about whether or not the Republican Party still takes positions on gender traditionalism. Mm -hmm. I would point to women in combat. I would point to equal pay and Lily Ledbetter. Mm -hmm. I would point to support for government uh, and child care. I would point to contraception. I mean, I think there are yeah. lots of ways in which we still, mm -hmm. I, I think you've made some marvelous points here and, and I, on that, but whether or not the parties are still separate on other gender issues, I think we could think about it in lots of ways. Well, you probably follow some of those controversies better than I do, but the Lily led better. I mean, was it, do you think it was um, gender traditionalism or is it concerned about lawsuits? I mean, it wasn't. So you could argue on, I think, all yeah. of these issues, yeah. going from child care to all sorts of things, whether or not this is an issue of small government conservatism, mm -hmm. right? Government shouldn't tell businesses you need to yeah. provide tax break, or, or government shouldn't be in the business of tax breaks for X, Y, or Z, mm -hmm. although we all, I mean, both parties love tax breaks for whatever they're preferred. I mean, that's just become a way of hiding what you're actually doing in policy making. There's great work on that, but um, uh, so yes, there's a there's a you could make a very strong sort of um, anti lawsuit argument that the Ledbetter issue was that she had it gone on too long, right? That right. she didn't find right. out about it for right. twenty years. Right. There's a statute of limitations. Statute right. of limitations right. from when she was first discriminated against. Right. Sure. You could make that argument. <laughs> You're saying one shouldn't. I, I'm, I'm saying, saying that I, I think that, boy, Christina. there's an opportunity to come down for equal pay, and you're really going to say that you yeah. were discriminated against for 20 years, but because you didn't know about it until five minutes ago, you can't sue? I just, it just, it's an odd position, well, maybe just it's politically. Odd, well, maybe it's an odd position, but I mean, there's sort of this question of volition, right? So no, like, what, what, what's actually, I mean, you could say it's nonsensical, but that's a different kind of critique, it seems to me, than saying, it's actual traditionalism in their hearts and minds that's making them, right, that's... I'll go even a step further and say what I say in class when I talk about the differences between the parties on women's rights issues. Is I think there's a real argument, and abortion's an example, about mm -hmm. what sort of public policies are best if, was, if the outcome one's looking for is equality yes. and opportunity. Whether or not government should be involved in child care, I think you can be against that and still be for excellency. I agree entirely. Yeah. I just, I think... <laughs> I think we could still find some gender traditionalism in our debates. I mean, how are we still not, I mean, really, the working mothers thing goes on for three days, you know, a week? Mm -hmm. I, I, I do, you know, whether or not that's what's driving abortion activism is a different issue. Right, right. And actually, I mean, that's, I mean, that's sort of the narrow point I would make. Although you're right, implications, I sort of think this is becoming at least quite marginal. And that's fair enough. Yeah. Uh, I'm Mike Desch. I don't do American politics, but I've stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. So, uh, <laughs> let me give it a try. I don't really do American politics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what do you say about the Catholic uh, 
position, uh, you know, uh, strikes me um, uh, as uh, as accurate. I was mean, thinking about that even before you got this discussion of the segue between the anti-Vietnam War movement and the pro-life movement, the overlap between the Catholic pro-life movement and the uh, nuclear freeze movement and, and things like that. Um, but the question that occurred to me is whether Catholics are different. Um, and what the rest of the, uh, you know, the pro-life coalition looks like. And now, I don't, I don't know what the, what the figures are. I wouldn't right. be surprised to learn that Catholics are uh, a big part of the, uh, the pro-life movement. But I wonder, you know, given that the pro-life movement now is a coalition not only of Catholics, uh, based, you know, probably largely on a, on a pro-life uh, you know, uh, belief based in theology, but also a lot of other groups. Whether uh, the you know the large element uh, of Catholicism that's focused specifically on the life issue might not be masking the importance of uh, some of the culture war issues uh, in the other elements of the. Uh, you mean the Protestants? Yeah, the Protestants. Uh, well, um, I think there's um, well. I think there is certainly something, um, you know, you certainly see stark differences um, among um, sort of, in, 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 you know, if you go back to the 70s and 80s, right? I mean, so there was something very sort of um, striking about the fact that you had this rescue movement, it was pioneered by Catholics who were living on the left. And suddenly you get Protestants, and not just Protestants, but really Protestant fundamentalists who were inspired by Schaefer. And you do get something of a clash, uh, I think, on, on gender for sure. Um, as actually with quote what I've been Julie Loesch I suggest. But um, but today I think those 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 differences are not as sharp actually. You know, that, um, uh, I mean I think you know the pro life issue appeals to a broad range of Protestants, right? Not all of whom are are uh, certainly not all of whom are concerned about gender issues. When I started hanging out with the uh, pro-life activists, if I was doing my research, I was struck at the, the young Protestants, actually, who were who were not what I imagined. I mean, you know, they were, um, you know, young were, um, I mean, they sort of had this sort of hippie aesthetic, first of all, but they, they were, you know, a lot of them were vegans, they were uh, opposed to the war, um, they, um, uh, uh, one of the kids had dreadlocks, and he was the sort of, sort of kid I, I sort of imagined be asking for change on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley or something, right? I mean, it's sort of that, that wasn't what I was expecting. So, um, so I guess I was struck by how many Protestants sort of uh, reminded me of at least the description of some of the Catholics back in the 70s who had pioneered that radical wing of movement. So, um, I think there's a lot of ideational diversity um, in the pro-life movement, regardless of whether you're talking about Protestants or whether you're talking about I think there's a lot of diversity in both camps. But I think the big story, in some ways, is not so much the difference between Protestants and Catholics. It's really just sort of generational change. I mean, as each new generation of pro-life activists comes of age, they're just much more liberal, you know, on a lot of these questions. And I think that's that's a very powerful story across uh, uh, across both Protestants and Catholics. Uh, so, in talking about the activists, and in particular the earlier generation yeah. activists, you talked a lot about gender that you didn't talk much about. Gender. And anecdotally, it seems to me yeah. that um, the earlier generation of activists were also for abstinence and education, and as a matter of public policy, have not supported any kind of preventive measures. They kind of want this all or nothing approach to the abortion issue. And so I guess it seems like what some of that older generation is, <coughs> is your ranks. seems to be related to the birth control issue with both the Catholics and Protestants. And then a related question might be whether or not moving forward the more ambivalent generation will support more of a preventive thing approach as a matter of public policy rather than moving abortion and moving kind of question. Well, I don't, um, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that the um, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that the, um, uh, 
I mean, I sort of mentioned this in the talk, but I mean, when you talk to pro-life activists, and you look at the historical evidence, you know, this is it's really sort of the issue for them. You know, and, and they may um, they may have um, they may have conservative views on some of these questions, right? Sexual morality. Um, I think that's certainly true, um, but they're just not right. They're just in another category, right? From uh, their, their views about abortion, that is qualitatively far less important. Um, and one of the things that's true about a lot of the pro-life organizations is that um, they've, ex you know, they they're they're intentionally sort of single issue, right? So they're not um, they're not going to lobby. So the National Rights Life Committee is going to really try to clean pretty close to that issue, right? Sometimes the abortion issue touches other things like health care reform and they'll get involved. But, um, but, you know, that's, right, that's sort of their, their main issue and, and they're not going to be sort of blind to other issues. And sometimes they're criticized for doing so. Um, sometimes from the left, for people who say, well, you should care about, you know, some larger, um, you know, so social ethic, uh, you should care about social welfare, these kinds of things. But the truth is that if those pro-life organizations start, org start really emphasizing those kinds of issues, they're going to lose some of their members, right? Because again, their members are being diverse on a lot of other kinds of political questions. And, you know, and so if those leaders started to say, well, we're going to start fighting X, Y, and Z, you just start losing people, right? And they, they, so that, that's the issue that really holds them together, and that's the one that they really emphasize. So this is the emphasis on Well, but I, I think you really see that from, um, uh, you know, from the national national rights life. Right? I mean, it's it's, it's not. You don't think so? Do you think of the I mean, you know, uh, I, I, the details aren't close to mind at the moment. 
but you know, he, he tries to construe some some of the things that some of the prolects said as evidence for Uber and, and, it's, and it's not persuasive. I mean, and he's already talking about a minority of people, right? He's already acknowledging that um, uh, that you know that um, uh, you know this is not a big issue. This is not an important issue for for actually becoming becoming an activist. Yeah. Just to clarify, come back again one more time to the issue of the uh, written previously about political parties. Yeah. Uh, so if I understood you right, you're somewhat linking the durability of the issue uh, to the plausible link that both sides can maintain between sort of with the uh, their liberal tradition. Um, so I'm just wondering if. if Contra that, we could think about uh, the alignment of extremists or activists on the abortion issue with, with party activists. I'm especially thinking here, I'm not the opinion guy at all, but, but um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Democratic Party kind of, so to speak, got religion on the abortion issue in the 90s and really kind of made this matter of party discipline. You got far fewer folks on the House floor who were, who were openly uh, pro life after the, you know, the early 90s direction. Um, and so that if, if instead we could sort of uh, understand the ongoing durability of the issue as the, the happy alignment of activists on the abortion issue with party activists. And that if, if that's a way of thinking about it, that therefore we might see the salience of the issue actually decline um, as perhaps the Democratic Party moves to a strategy of kind of trying to pick off the, the um, <coughs> youthful, post-religious moving in a socially liberal direction, and, and therefore it stops wanting to adopt the strategy of being kind of towing a, a, a line on the abortion issue and willing to have more of an accurate view on that issue. Does that make sense? Well, I'm not sure I exactly followed the, the sort of narrative pretty forth, but I, I mean, you know, the, um, I mean, the abortion issue is a headache, right, for a lot of politicians, right, because it divides their constituents, yeah. and so it's, um, I mean, activists inside the party care a lot about it, um, and so it's sort of thrust upon the party, that both parties in some sense, they know. Uh, but, um, um, <coughs> but it's it's often an issue that right, candidates want to get some distance from, or at least moderate. You see this particularly, um, um, I think particularly in the Republican Party in some ways. I mean, uh, you know, it's striking to me that um, recent, um, you know, that Republican uh, presidents um, have not, you know, they haven't really wanted to take on this issue in some ways, right? I mean, they wanted to talk, I mean, you know, Bush, for example, talked about having a culture of life, um, and that was a way for him to say, right, I mean, I don't want to make a policy here in some ways, right? It was just, it was a way of saying, we want a different kind of culture, um, and, uh, but he didn't really want to explicitly make on well, right, or say that it should be overturned, um, or really, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, embrace the pro-life point of view in a sort of in a sort of serious way. So, if there were, say, sort of a reciprocal movement on the left, yeah, would you see that as eroding the, the durability of the salience of the issue, or, or do you still see it as something that persists in the same force that it has on the basis of party Yeah, I, I see it. Just, right? I mean, we've had uh, almost half a century now. I'll make a case for more and more of the same. You know, I mean, there's a certain case for continuity, um, um, at least in the you know, next, next half century. I mean, I don't, I mean who knows what happens after that? But, uh, but yeah, I think it's. Uh, I, I don't see much. I mean, maybe I'd appeal to uh, uh, jump out party politics and those dynamics, but I, I, I don't see a. Uh, I, don't, I certainly don't see a dampening of enthusiasm on on the pro life side. You know, uh, of, of, of the movement for sure. Get two hands in the back. Um, I guess I have I have a couple questions. One, because I'm a little. One has to do about evidence, and then one has to do with the hypothesis that you're presenting. Um, and so, one is part of a piece of evidence that I would have any information on would be helpful for me is sure. if. Uh, or part of your hypothesis is that because of, because the morals underlying abortion is so extreme because it's murder and you have to fight for murder or not mm -hmm. or against murder or not 
Um, I'm wondering if that same stagnant trend and then the same trend in the youth cohort happens with capital punishment, because that's another thing where I would say that you know it's a similar extreme case. The other reason I bring that up is because I, I'm also wondering, this goes back to Chris's point about you know, getting into activism is often because of a, it's not like a, you happen to run into an activist and get tied to them, it's actually about your friends are joining. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if using that relationship type of understanding, if that same thing can be made, that same hypothesis, same mechanism can be applied to a hypothesis that says the abstraction of, the abstract nature of abortion, just like the abstract nature of capital punishment, keeps it steady because you don't know, it, it, it's a private thing. I mean, if someone gets an abortion or some, you know, if you know someone that was put to death, you, you're probably not sharing that. But over time, when these other issues have gone down in um, opposition, I mean, knowing someone who's gay, knowing someone who, w women in the workplace, knowing an interracial, you know, marriage or couple, those seem to be more visual, more public, more, people are starting to un know, have personal connections to people. And I wonder if that personal connections has something to do with this versus this abstract. Um, if that could be used to explain how one thing stays stable and the other things go, go down in opposition. What, what, what's, yeah. what's, what's the other thing that's going down? So you were saying like opposition to gay marriage yeah, is going yeah. down in the, in the millennials group, opposition to um, women in the workplace is going down, opposition to oh, rights are all going down. And I'm wondering if it's because those are more publicly visual, interactive relationship type events. You know someone who, and so there's a personal face to that issue to you. There isn't that personal face. Yeah, you're, you're, saying that, you're saying some issues, some culture war issues cut through people's living rooms and some don't. Right. You know, so like your, your one, one of your hypotheses was like, you know, that some conservatives get more personal about this and they just kind of leave it to personal politics and they quiet down about it. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah, interesting question. So the first on uh, capital punishment. Um, well, I mean, there's certain Catholics in particular who wanted to lump capital punishment in with right. um, a larger sort of pro-life mission for life groups, and um, and they've but that hasn't happened because it's such a divisive issue. Us in particular tend to be more in favor of it. Um, so it's it's been a kind of deal breaker at least. For um, life organizations. Um, I think as a as a public issue, it's um, I mean it's not a, it's not a subject I study, but I, I do know that it's important for the death penalty. It's just it's just extremely popular. You know, I mean across very different kinds of demographics, across uh, you know among liberals, among conservatives, Democrats, and Republicans, it's a it, it's just a small minority of Americans who really really oppose the death penalty. But has it stayed stable? I mean, has it, no, it fluctuates? And with the millennials, do we know if it's? That I don't know. The millennials, I don't know, Dave, uh, uh, Well, young people, sort of underscoring John's point about mm -hmm. why abortion is so unusual, um, young people are just to the left on all of these issues, including capital punishment, but the population as a whole, including young people, yeah. that you, you, while the, Majority always oppose, or always support the death penalty. You do see fluctuation, and it's actually tied pretty closely to the crime rate. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there is a great book on innocence frames the death penalty for Yeah. Um, and then also, I think that in the pro-life world, there's just a. I mean, you know, there's often it is even among those who are opposed to the death penalty. There's still, I think, some sense that it's different to take innocent life versus. But right, right, there is some sense that it's 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 a different kind of thing to kill um, a mass murderer, right? Than, um, um, so it it um, it's not clear that it, it would have the kind of um, it's not clear to me it's, it's an issue. It would have the kind of um, uh, uh, sort of volitional power, right? It would sort of mobilize people in mass and uh, in, 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 in the right flight movement. Um, as far as you know, the, the significance of, of some issues, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of an interesting question, right? I mean, there are some cultural issues that really cut through people's living rooms, right? And, and others that do not, right? Um, but, um, but I would say that abortion is certainly an issue that does, right? I mean, there's a lot of activists in the right to life who have right? And then 
and then um, had a bad experience, and that experience in part um, informs their own activism. Um, but that's different than like so your aunt is sharing the story with you. Do you know what I mean? Like if there's if there's figureheads that are talking about it, that's different than you know my aunt's gay, my cousin had an interracial marriage, my mom works for a living, mm -hmm. you know, and then. My sister had an abortion. I mean, you don't really, that part doesn't get shared very thin. So well, I'm wondering if it's more no, that's, that's an assumption, but I'm not sure that's true. I mean, I don't know to what extent that would be true within families, right? I mean, um, I mean, actually, I, I, I don't really like that. I have a question about that. I mean, like, my, I mean, my sense is that you don't often hear, I mean, like, if you ask people, you know, do you know someone who has had an abortion? Right. You, you know, I think that you get much smaller amounts than the actual number of abortions. But, but again, I mean, that's yeah. a great question to ask, to say yeah. empirically, like, how broadly or how many, you know, come from, you know, who is told? Them? Because it is sort of, it's more privately held than a lot of... Oh, well, I agree, right? Yeah. I mean, it's different from, right? I mean, there's no yeah. concealing one's divorce, right? One can seal one's abortion. Um, it, it probably is reasonable to, to suggest that it is it is something you can keep a secret. Um, but, right, there's... A lot of abortions happen, right? So you think some large percentage of them would be would be known? There's some percentage, even if it was a small percentage, right? You think that's a lot of living rooms. Uh, so um, I don't I don't know. I, it's, it's, I, I but frankly, I've not seen actual data on that question. So, um, so, so I wanted I to make know. sure put Perry Arnold in the back to try to get in there for a while. Thank you, Dave. Um, <laughs> so. Um, my, my question is, I'm curious that you address no policy consequences of all of this. So you've, you've highlighted generational change um, and the persistence of uh, abortion sentiment, and you've associated generational change with an increasing acceptance of other kinds of social liberalism, but the persistence of abortion. And what I'm curious about do you envision any change in policy preferences amongst those, particularly millennials perhaps, who are still anti-abortion but pro-gay marriage, etc.? In other words, to put this in a kind of shorthand, is their preference still another Scalia on the court or more very conservative Republican members of legislatures to shut down yeah, social so welfare, I, gay I, marriage, etc.? Or is there another option for a, 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 for pro-life going forward? I mean, is there another option? Another policy option um, for reducing abortions I in see. a way that makes pro-life satisfied, but yet allows for other social policy options that are less conservative? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's... Um, um, I'm not sure I, I totally followed this, but the, the, um, um, yeah, I mean, um, uh, I mean, it strikes me that, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite clear to me that there's not, a, I mean, the Christian right, right, I mean, he's not had a lot of policy successes in general, right, and there's, there's not a lot of reason to believe that they'll have, um, uh, you know, Many in the future as social liberalism. I think. How about at the state level? What's that? Sorry? How about in state legislatures? Yeah. Well, you, you see um, some of it there, right? I mean, you see certain you know modest restrictions on abortion, like the kind the kinds of ones that uh, that allow. Um, but uh, you know, and certainly you see bans on gay marriage, right? So, um, but. You know, in some ways, I mean, I think this is, I mean, Clyde Wilcox has argued this, I think this is, this is right. I mean, there's, um, movement hasn't had great success, right? I mean, uh, despite the fact that it's, uh, maybe it's, it's uh, uh, greatest success in some ways was defeating the ERA. But in that case, right, they had, I mean, it's not a sort of built-in advantage if you're trying to defeat uh, a constitutional amendment, right? Because it's geared to protect minorities who don't, who don't like constitutional change. Um, so they were. That was probably in some ways their most important success. But I don't. I don't see a lot of policy consequences in some ways coming out of the out of the 
kind of the religious right, right? Even occasionally when there's, you know, they succeed in, in uh, getting some creationist curriculum in a local school, it's, you know, once the school, but once the community finds out about this, right, usually a new school board election, they're thrown out, and uh, things change, things change once. But let me follow up, regime. because you've disassociated in the talk anti-abortion sentiment from the Christian right. I mean, you've argued that we've had a kind of generational change, which has created a new kind of, of pro-life sentiment. What will that lead to in terms of policy change? Uh, I, mean, I agree with you. The well, Christian right yeah. is a kind of yesterday. Right, 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 right. Um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, what, 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 what will this mean for other kinds of um, uh, policies? I, 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 I actually, I to minimize mean, abortion. Oh, to minimize abortion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, I see. Um, well, I would say two things. I mean, one, I think, um, I think one of the things that's happened inside the pro-life pro movement is that there's much more emphasis on moral suasion, right, than there used to be. And I think that's partly just an adaptation to the fact that, you know, they can't do a lot politically to change policy, right? We're sort of locked in uh, by the courts, right? So there's very marginal things one can do policy-wise. Uh, so, you know, you have some people inside Congress who are pushing for very marginal things, right, uh, or relatively marginal things. Um, but there's not... There's not big policy ambitions there, right, in some ways, because not much can be done. Um, and so you've got a lot of groups that are really just focused on moral suasion, right? And, and their, their goal is, well, we've sort of accepted the fact that abortion is reality. It's been here a long time. And now we're just going to change people's choices, right? We're, we're, we're in a sense, going to adapt to and work with what is, in effect, a culture and regime of choice, you know, and, and try to further our agenda this way, right? So you have lots of crisis pregnancy centers, right, as I mentioned in the talk, right, over 2,000 of them. We've got a lot of groups that go to college campuses in which they show uh, images of aborted fetuses in an effort to sort of change the hearts and minds of young people. Um, you've, got a, you've got people that drive trucks through countries that are sort of paneled with images, right? So I think most of the energy in some ways in the pro-life movement is doing those kinds of things. You've got people at front of clinics, right, just trying to talk to women and men as they enter those clinics. Um, and I think that's where, in some ways, most of the energy is, because there is a sense that, right, things things aren't going to change. And even even on the policy side, right, even if you look at, uh, say, for example, uh, the ban on partial partial birth abortion, uh, uh, partial birth abortion, the NRLC wanted that ban not really because they thought it would affect abortion rights, right? Because after all, it's just a procedure, right? They knew that, right? Um, and uh, they didn't really regard it as any worse than the other procedures that are done uh, for, for late-term abortion. They wanted that ban uh, because it was, um, it was a great way of dramatizing cause, right? They saw it as a tool of moral suasion because it meant that suddenly when people read articles, they'd see these cartoon drawings of the procedure and they said, oh my goodness, right? This is, this is what a second trimester abortion sometimes looks like. Um, so, in a weird way, actually, the defeat of, um, the, or the success of that amendment was bad for the pro-life group, right? They liked the controversy. Um, they didn't think the policy itself would, would, uh, would, would be of any consequence. Why don't we take just one last question and make it very clear. Oh, yeah, just going back to the question on abortion cutting through people's living rooms. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your talk, Juno and Knocked Up. And so in one way we, we encounter abortion is through knowing someone who tells us their story, but another right. way is the way it's depicted in our culture, right. through television and film. And I've been sitting here thinking, I mean, in Juno and Knocked Up, of course, women who for whom the pregnancy is extremely inconvenient choose that to continue the pregnancy. But right. I've been trying to think of some alternative in which a woman deciding to end a pregnancy because it's extremely inconvenient to her make her life <coughs> Is depicted favorably, and I, and I can't think of that. Any, of anything like that. Maybe I just I haven't encountered it. But yeah. I mean, certainly in the history of movies and, and television, that is a movie case. And I think maybe we should ask, why is that? I mean, is that not also, in some to some degree, the result of some sort of uh, remaining gender traditionalism and traditional views of life? You know, if a woman gets pregnant, even if it's even if it hurts her career or hurts her, you know, Juno's in high school, uh, we still depict her as. Discovering the joys of motherhood, deciding to continue with it despite the. So why? Why do we well, continue? Well, there has, there has been some pro-choice. I mean, so um, the ones as of late. I mean, I think what's striking about, um, I think what's striking about Juno and Knocked Up is that you have 
pro-life films. I mean, that's what's surprising, right, that Hollywood has done this. Um, so, but, um, but yeah, there, there's been pro, uh, pro-choice films that dramatize the, that, that choice in a way that's sympathetic to the, the pro-choice kind of view. So, um, so I guess I would just disagree with the premise. I guess there's more of that up there. In the early 1970s, on the television sitcom Maud, Maud famously had abortion. There you go. You can go to the TV and watch. That's the most famous case on television ever. I dare you. I think of another case in the last 10 years. Seriously. Yeah, there's a Campbell's lot. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Maud. Um, John, we clocked once, twice, a third time. Yes, thank you. Just with your boxes, stack them on the table if you would. There's another meeting in here afterwards, so if you can make sure you're tidied up uh, where you've been sitting.